Good morning. Uh, thanks for joining us again today for our message. Uh, we're continuing our series in uh, this thought of unlimiting God. And today we're going to talk about one that may be a little bit hard to, to unpack, about how we limit God through pride. So as we begin, would you join me in a, in a word of prayer today? Heavenly Father, thank you again um, that you have given us the privilege to be able to, to call you Father. You have saved us, you have redeemed us, and you have identified us as your children, your dearly loved children. And so help us to respond to your love in obedience. Help us to recognize not only who you are, but our, our brokenness as well. So teach us today from your scripture, teach us from um, the, the mistakes that we can see in scripture, as well as to be able to, to listen and to heed the, the guidance that you've given us in your word. Uh, bless us in this time today, and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you, you want to get your, your scripture out and start getting it ready, we're going to be camping out a little bit in the, the book of 1 Samuel. Um, talk about pride today. And there are, are different aspects to, to pride as we understand it. There's a, there's a healthy side to, to pride as well as a sinful side. And, and sometimes we can begin on the healthy side and, and cross over and Sometimes we, we just launch straight into to sin. So it, it's not bad to have some measure of satisfaction and, and pride um, when we finish an assignment and, and we do it well. It, it's not wrong to have pride in something that we've built or a, a business that we've uh, established. Uh, it, it's okay to be proud of, of family members for who they are and, and what they're doing with their, their lives. But there's a reason why that classic seven deadly sins uh, starts with, with pride. Uh, one definition of, of pride that is given in a dictionary is that that feeling or deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from one, one own, one's own achievements. And so uh, pride, it, it starts here and it, it just uh, plays its little game right here in us. So let's try not to just zip past this one um, thinking, you know, I, I don't have an issue with this at all. So if that's what you're, you're, you're thinking right now, you've already proved my point that you need to stick with this and listen to what God's word says today about, about pride. Because honestly, it's not just the male of the, the species who starts putting something together and then uh, only looks at the assembly instructions uh, when you run into major problems or, or after you get it all together and oh, all of a sudden we've got extra pieces. What, what are those supposed to be for? We all do it, don't we? Whether we're putting toys together for our kids or we're operating some new gadget or we're navigating life and, and faith. And we can get practiced, really, in, in just launching right into it and winging it. And our limited insights and our experience uh, simply win, can win many of the times over the, the written instructions that have been provided for us. So today we're going to dig into to 1 Samuel, and we're going to do a fast-forward sketch of, of King Saul and his career, because in the, the very beginning, it started out on the right track, but it derailed pretty quickly into his time. And our lesson not only includes the, the king's pride in, in action, but uh, it's also the, the majority of the people of Israel. Um, their pride is, is very much at, at work in, in what's going on in, in that day. So, again, rewind the tape a little bit here. Recall what God has said to his people already to that point. He frees Israel from 400 years, 400 years of Egyptian slavery when the people are, are griping when God has set them free and led them into the wilderness. And they go out and there, there's a body of water. The Red Sea is blocking them. And, and they complain to, to God and to Moses. But this is what... God tells them through Moses in Exodus 14 that the Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. And God takes them through the river. But they're still whining. 
they have this cycle of grumbling and, and, and whining. And in Deuteronomy 1, it says, The Lord your God who is going before you will fight for you as he did in, in Egypt. It reminds them again, he's got to do this over and over again through Moses in Deuteronomy 3. Do not be afraid of them, those, those enemy nations who are trying to, to take you. The Lord your God himself will fight for you. And then in Deuteronomy 20, Hear, O Israel, today you are going into battle against your enemies. Do not be faint-hearted or afraid. Do not be terrified or give way to panic before them. Now listen, for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. Now, the, these repeated reminders, they, they couldn't be any clearer, could they? But time passes and memories fade. And, and we know that what that's like, don't we? Because uh, just like we have little to no connection to what happened in the 1700s uh, to get our country uh, established and, and, and free, uh, 400 years have passed since the escape, the exodus out of Egypt. And it has brought the people of God to the place where, again, they, they don't want to listen to God. They don't want to listen to God's chosen leaders, even though they're speaking God's words to them. And so let's pick up our, our little trek here through 1 Samuel. Uh, go to chapter 8, 1 Samuel chapter 8. And Samuel is a prophet, he is a judge, and he is, is a priest. There's not often in the, the Old Testament where uh, one person is giving multiple responsibilities, but a uh, judge, priest, and prophet for, for Samuel. And he is a good, godly man doing God's work, but his, his two sons, not so much. And so 1 Samuel chapter 8, at the, the beginning of the chapter here, Samuel's growing old. Um, he has two sons. In verse 2, it tells us Joel and Abijah. But verse 3 tells us that his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So the, the elders didn't like that. Verse 4, the elders gathered together and came to Samuel and they said, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. Okay, so we're starting to get the gist of where the people of God are looking to for, for leadership. So verse 6, this, it, it displeased Samuel. It, it upsets him. And so he goes to prayer. Verse 7, so the... the in prayer, the Lord tells him, Listen to all the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected. They have rejected me, God, as their, their king. So God continues to have a little talk with Samuel. Verse 9, he tells him, Prophet, listen to them. Listen to them, but warn them solemnly. Let them know what the king who will reign over them will, will do. And through Samuel then, he's going to give God's people a, a reality check. In the, the middle of verse 11 then, he begins this, this litany of this king. He will take your, your sons. Verse 13, he will take your, your daughters. Verse 14, he will take the best of your fields. Verse 15, he will take the tenth of your grain. Verse 16, your, your servants, the best of your cattle, he will take for his own. Verse 17, he will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. And when that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, and the Lord will not answer you in that day. 19, nevertheless, that the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations. With a king to lead us, 
and to go out before us and fight our battles. <laughs> what? Now, I, I realize 400 years has passed, but what a contrast, isn't it? Of God repeatedly telling his people, I will fight for you. I will go with you. I will go before you. To the point where they're saying, we, we want a, a human. We want to be like all the other nations. And we want a human king to, to lead us into to battle. So verse 22, verse 22, the Lord answered and he told Samuel, listen to them and give them a king. So here we go. Here's the, the first king, 1 Samuel chapter 9. The second verse tells us about Saul, who was an impressive young man without equal among the Israelites, a head taller than any of the others. Okay, so physically he is the, the best. He, literally, he, he's a head above everybody else. But not just physically is he going to stand out. Then God equips him spiritually. So 1 Samuel chapter 10 then, Samuel has identified Saul to be the first king and he's going to anoint him into that God-chosen position. So 1 Samuel chapter 10, skip down to verse 6. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you in, in power and you will prophesy with the, the other prophets and you will be changed into a different person. And once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Okay? All right, so uh, the, the best of the best, humanly speaking. God has uh, equipped him spiritually speaking. And then God gives Saul some specific instructions on, on what to do next through the prophet Samuel. So verse 8 of chapter 10. Go down ahead of me, Saul, to, to Gilgal. I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. But you must wait seven days. Okay, keep this in mind. Wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. Okay, so this comes to, to be. The, the, the Spirit of God comes upon Saul. Uh, it, it fills him, it, it equips him, and empowers him. And Saul gets right to work to defend God's people. But one of their perpetual enemies now then is hearing about what's going on, the, the, the Philistines. And they're not just going to lay down and surrender. So let's unpack the story here. Skip to chapter 13, 1 Samuel 13. Let's look here what happens. So Saul's not a young man, in a sense a, a boy, anymore. It tells us that he was 30 years old when he became king. So, verse 2, Saul chose 3,000 men from Israel. These are his, his first little army. 2,000 were with him at Michmash in, in the hill country of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan. So that's Saul's son at Gibeah in Benjamin. The rest of the men he sent back to their homes. So, again, where did he get that number from? I mean, maybe just looked out at the crowd and, oh, that's, that's good enough. So verse 3 tells us, Then son Jonathan attacked the Philistines, Philistine outpost at Geba, and the Philistines heard about it. Then Saul had the trumpet blown throughout the land and said, Let the Hebrews hear. So all Israel heard the news. Saul has attacked the Philistine outpost, and now Israel has become a stench to the Philistines. And the people were summoned to join Saul. And the Philistines assembled to fight Israel. And look at what the numbers that they have. Remember, Saul's got 3,000 guys. The Philistines have 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sands on the seashore. Verse 6, When the men of Israel saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard-pressed, what did they do? They hid. <laughs> Saul's leadership is not, not doing well here, is it? Verse 7, then, Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. 
So he said, Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering just as he finished making the offering. Can you imagine? Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived and Saul went out to, to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, When I saw that the men were scattering, and that you did not come at the set time, and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, Now the Philistines will come down against me, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer a burnt offering. You acted foolishly, Samuel said. You have not kept the Lord's command. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Then Samuel left Gilgal and went up to Gibeah in Benjamin. And Saul counted the men who were with him. They numbered only about six hundred. Hmm. Now, we've got these very simple facts. They're, they're not hard to understand. Samuel said, wait seven days. And Saul only had to, to be still and wait seven days. Days. It was just a, a, a week for Samuel to show up and instruct the king on, on what to do next. Saul focused, though, on the enemy, and he allowed everything around him to cloud his judgment. He looked at the enemy, and then he looked at his ever-shrinking army, and then he justifies this to make a, a foolish decision. God had given him very specific instructions through Samuel. And, and that was Saul's sin. That was his downfall. Not paying attention to God's words, to God's specific instructions. And the king's pride then not only shortened his patience and led to a choice based on fear instead of God's revealed truth, but then when Samuel does show up on that seventh day, Saul blames Samuel for not showing up in a timely manner. <laughs> Can you, you imagine? But that's exactly how the the game has been played right from the start, hasn't it? God said, you can eat from any tree in, in the garden except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eat it and you will die. And then Satan twists God's words in Eve's ear and she eats from the tree and passes it on to, to Adam. And when God comes from, for his regular visit with them, to, to walk and to, to talk with them, and he asks Adam, Have you eaten from the tree I have commanded you not to eat from? Adam doesn't just give a simple answer, yes. Immediately, remember what he says? He tells God, the, the, the woman you gave me, the woman you put me here with gave me the fruit to eat. And then Eve, she keeps passing the buck as well, and she blames the, the serpent. They did not take God at his word. King Saul did not take God at his word. And he doesn't learn from this transgression either or from the rebuke from, from Samuel. But as you un, keep unfolding the, the story here, Saul continues to rely on, on his pride and openly disregard God's very specific instructions to him. 
Skip ahead to 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel 15, go to, to verse 3. God's instructions through Samuel. Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything. Okay, is there ambiguity there? Totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. Okay, abundantly clear, right? Now skip down to verse 9. But Saul and the army spared their king Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and the lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely. But everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. Hmm. Again, God's word was very specific. And yet Saul's pride took over. And, and his army followed his instruction. Some truth from the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 11. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. Proverbs 13, pride only breeds quarrels, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. Proverbs 16, pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit, a proud spirit, before a fall. We have to do some self-reflection here, don't we, today? Because in this series, we keep coming back to the, the, the fact that God wants to love us to love him with, with all of our, our, our being, with our heart, with our mind, with our, our soul, with our, our, our will, all of us. But we also have to recognize pride invades all of us. Pride invades our thoughts. Pride will dictate our, our, our feelings. Pride will take over our, our will. And so when we choose to listen to ourselves instead of paying to attention to, to God's word, we are saying to God, I know better than you. I, I'm more important than, than you. My, my priorities, my agenda should take precedent over your plans and, and purposes. See, pride is that desire in us to, to receive more glory, more praise, more attention. It's the desire for us to be noticed and praised and compensated for our successes rather than seeing God glorified. And a proud person is confident then in, in their uh, ability and, and not reliant on, on God's grace and provision and wisdom. Again, we need to take a look in the, the mirror and do some self-reflection. Pride is probably winning the war in our lives if we frequently make ourselves the center of attention. If we go into a room and it has to be all about us. Pride is probably winning the war in us if we, we struggle to, to connect and empathize with other people and their troubles. If we feel unhappy then when we are not praised, pride is probably winning the war in us. If we are constantly monitoring and checking in to see what other people think about us, pride at work. If we very collectively select the audience that we are going to, to present ourselves to, if we avoid people who are more talented than, than we are, pride. And if we can easily do our assessment of others and see all their flaws, it's pride. I want to give you three things as we, we wrap up today of uh, how do we battle against that? How do we battle against the, the pride that limits God from imparting more life to us? 
And the, the, the first thing is that we need to identify the lies. We need to call them out, because if we never bother to sort out the, the, what is true from what is false, the, the truth from the lies, we are going to remain, in a sense, deluded and confused and, and, and crazy. John reminds us in his gospel in chapter 8 that, that Satan is the father of lies. And if we don't identify some of those, those lies, then we are going to continue to, to live by them. Because pride is fed by, by lies that, that we believe. Lies like, you know, I, I know. I know myself. I know myself best. And I know what's best for, for me more than God does. It's a lie. Another lie is, Success in my life is, is going to come from, from my abilities and, and my efforts. I have to, to do it. I have to make it happen. It's a lie. Pride says, you know, I know I'm a, a sinner, but, but my sin is not that serious. Why? My comfort is more important than, than others' comfort. It's a lie. And we will often tell ourselves, you know, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an okay person. I'm humble enough. It's a lie. Identify the, the lies. And how do we do that? The second thing is that we must increase God and we must decrease self. Again, the, the Gospel of John reminds us of this. And uh, the disciple John is, is writing about John the, the Baptist because in his uh, presentation of, of, of Jesus, his introduction of Jesus to the, the world, uh, people are a little bit confused. Okay, who's the Messiah? We thought maybe you were the Messiah and then this Jesus guy shows up. Um, uh, who, who's the Who's the real one? And, and John very clearly tells them that, that he, Jesus, must become greater and I must become less. And that has to be true for, for us as well. Remember Samuel's warning to the, the, the people when they make this request for a king? That this king, Saul, he is going to take and he is going to take and take and take and take and, and take. But we have the luxury of living in the, the time of, of Jesus. And when Christ becomes greater in our lives and we become less, what, is, what does Christ take from us? The only thing that Jesus takes from us is our sin. He doesn't steal our lives away from us. He doesn't rob us of the things that we need for life. The only thing that this Jesus takes is our sin. Paul reminds us in Ephesians 2, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them as one time, gratifying the cravings of our own sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath, but because of God's great love for us. God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. See, we must decrease so Christ can increase in, in our lives. And so the, the third thing is we have to constantly Remember Christ's example. Saul became king and he, and he didn't do so well. 
it was a short-lived success. And even his successor, David, it did pretty well, but David didn't finish well. There was, was failure. Not until Christ the King shows up is there a, a truly successful, trustworthy King. And this King only gives. And the only thing he takes away from us is our sin and the stuff that, that we don't need in our lives. We have to remember Christ's example often. And not just come to the point of remembering, oh yeah, Jesus died for my sins. That's, that's a wonderful promise. That's a wonderful reality. But we have to go back to God's word and we have to hear God's word and allow God's word to, to, to water us, to, to soak us, so that we can grow and we can continue to receive what he has to give to us. So listen, be reminded of Paul's words to the Philippians in Philippians 2. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Holy Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality something to be grasped. But he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Pride is, is a part of all of us. We are, are born with that sinful pride in us. My prayer for myself is I, I will take the time to examine God's word. I will take the time to, to pray. I will take the time to, to ask other trusted Christians in my life, how am I doing? So that we can do this battle together with the Spirit to allow more and more life to come into us so that we're not just breezing by and skipping over and limiting God and the life that he wants to bring uh, into us as well as into this, this world that is dark and lost and in need of his light and care. Close in prayer with me today. Precious Heavenly Father, thank you again. Thank you again that, that we can freely come together today. Thank you again for the, the gift of your scripture. Thank you again for the gift of your Holy Spirit. And again, it, it's easy just to, to listen to this message and check the box of, I got the sermon for the week, I've been to, to church for the week, and now I need to get back to, to work. You need to get back to the, the to-do list. But Lord, help us to be able to to have those moments of being still, those points of orientation and reorientation with, with you so that you will continue to set our hearts on that course toward eternity, to raise our, our eyes to the, the, the kingdom of, of heaven because you have told us that this life is, is just a, a breath. It's just like the morning mist that's going to burn off so quickly. God, help us in, in this world that is constantly confusing and, and continuing to choose its own king and, and own rulers so often. And all of them are going to, to fail. Help us. We need wisdom, O oh God. We need wisdom because even now, among believers and, and the church, we are on, often on, on different sides on, on issues and it is is not honoring to you. We, we don't bring you glory through that. And so, God, we need your help. And so help us to humble ourselves 
and to ask the questions. And when the answers come from your scripture or by your Holy Spirit, help us to listen and to respond in obedience for your honor and for your glory. Jesus, thank you for this day and everything that's in store for us and the rest of it. Pray these things in your holy name. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Uh, have a blessed week, and we'll see you soon.